Jim and Jesse, welcome to the podcast. It's it's great to have you. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's so good to be here, Kerry. It really is. I appreciate both of you being together. And I think I was first, uh, you know, I first got wind of your story when Jesse, I heard Rich Birch interview you on his Unseminary mm. podcast. And then Jim, I heard Sean Morgan interview you on his Leaders in Living Room podcast. That's right. And it's just a story I'd, I'd never heard told before in any church context like this, a story of burnout and coming back. But I think what really got me was the transparency and the honesty behind it. Because often when we tell our, our, our stories, we give people the sanitized version of it. We give them the cleaned up version of it. Right. And you guys have just been so raw and so honest, Jim, about a journey that you've been on. And then Jesse, that you had to kind of lead the church through. Uh, I thought it'd be great to have the conversation. And then, and then the fun part is right after I listened to your interview with Rich Birch, Jesse, I, I find myself like two weeks later in Cabo, Mexico with my wife. We're on the shuttle bus being taken to the place where we would have the retreat and I turn around and you're there with your wife and Jim is there with That's Robin. Right. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute, I, I'm just meeting the people I just heard their story of. And this is really yeah. cool. So here we are, you know, a and few Jesse's months behind later, you saying, recording. That's Carrie Newhoff right there. I was like, uh, Carrie Newhoff <laughs> listened to a podcast that I was on. What's happening? It was an out of body experience. I'll be honest. <laughs> so that was, that was providential, but, um, yeah. Yeah, so let's let's give us a little bit of context. Um, mm-hmm. I don't want to tell the story. I want you guys to tell the story. So, Jim, why don't we start with you, a little bit about your time at Flatirons leading yeah. up to it, and then, Jesse, how, how you play into the story, just to give people context who may not have the context, because I think it's it's an exceptional story, the way you guys tell it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so stop me anytime going, like, like, Move sure. on, move on, because it's like this. The story is a story. So I came to Flatirons in 2006. Um, this is my first like f- lead pastor gig. So obviously, I'm in over my head, and I had 20 some years of student ministry background. And I always say I'm just doing youth ministry for adults because people learn how people learn. Uh, so we do <laughs> keep it pretty raw and real. And um, uh, when I got here, we were meeting in a strip mall, and we had a staff of about 25. Uh, I think my first weekend here, it was uh, maybe 25, 2,600 people. The DNA of the place was, we care about loss and broken people. And like, I remember coming here and there was almost a palpable buzz. Uh, Rob and I looked at each other and goes, if they don't hire us, we should move here just to go to this place because they had such a heart for loss and broken people. And, and I did too as a youth pastor, you know? And um, so we came on, on board at 2006 and... Uh, God was doing something. Um, we're in Boulder County, which is kind of has a reputation of being pretty closed to the gospel. Um, uh, uh, open to almost everything. A very spiritual place, just not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and, just, uh, but, no Christianity, right? No, and, no, 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 no. Probably no. very um, progressive, like left leaning. In, in yeah, that way, yeah. politically, yeah. yeah. Everybody did weed here before we legalized it. Everybody did a, a lot of things, you know. But we all we've, we've led the way in a lot of very um, anyway. But we cared about lost and broken people, and uh, it was very much come as you are. And um, as as I began to, to teach the word of God here, people just responded, and yeah. it's in a crazy way. So that now the auditorium, we had to increase seating. We went to six services. We started breaking down walls so that people could sit in the lobby. And then we put in glass doors so people could sit outside with speakers. I mean, horrible sight lines. Uh, we, I remember one Easter, we had to send everybody to Taco Bell because our toilet, toilet didn't work. Um, it, was, it was just every, you know, everybody talks about like, you have to eliminate obstacles for people to come to church. Like we threw up as many as we could, you know, and people just kept coming because Mm -hmm. it was like, hey, it it makes sense. It makes sense. And this thing took off like a rocket ship. And so within 10 years, we went from 2,500 to, you know, knocking on 15, 16, 18, 20,000 people, 30,000 people for Easter. And we're like, hang on, you know, everybody's saying, if you build it, they will come. And they're like, they're coming, build something, you know, because it was just... 
Yeah. It was overwhelming and it was exciting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so we, we moved and we remodeled a Walmart and a, and, a, and a grocery store and connected them and, you know, 4,000 seat auditorium and then that maxed out. And now we're, and now we're going to launch campuses. And, and then about four or five years ago, I don't know if the world changed. I changed. I don't know. It almost is like the brakes went on. And um, we stopped growing. We stopped growing. Mm hmm uh, it plateaued. Uh, same about so the same time. So this is like uh, 2017, 2018. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We're in a new building. Yeah. We're launching campuses. Our, our numbers are up. The money's flowing. Everything that says you're winning, we were winning, right? And then it just hit a plateau. And about that same time, uh, Scott Nickel, my teaching pastor, who's a good friend, uh, he really felt called to to go back to a, a church that he grew up in and help lead there. And I always told him I didn't know how much we were a team. Mm. But my mind said, I'll just throw this thing on my back and I got this. And I've done a lot of counseling around that. <laughs> I, have to, I have to prove, <laughs> right, that I can do this. And, and, and we stopped. We, we stopped growing. And it just felt weird. And my life changed. Uh, and that's what I had to deal with on sabbatical is like, you know, what, what, what was going on there? And the answer was, so I, I learned this in counseling later, Carrie, is like, there's a thing called the dark side of leadership. My, my counselor, Harv Powers, uh, wrote a, a book called Redemptive, um, uh, I'm blanking. Redemptive leadership. Redemptive leadership. I'm sorry, Harv. Uh, <laughs> but, but there's a, there's a line in there about the dark side of leadership. And here's the tape that was playing in my head. Everybody hits their wagon to the 25% growth a year guy, and now you're not delivering. What's wrong with you? And then I looked in the mirror and went, wow. what's wrong with me? And so I just buckled down. And just because of my personality, all my emotions, fear, sadness, shame, they all come out as anger. So I just got angry and ran over everybody close to me. So, Man. Okay. and that's exhausting. So it went into a real season of unhealth, which we're going to unpack. I want to ask like 10 supplemental questions, but I think what I want to do at this point instead is go to Jesse. Jesse, where do you come into the picture? Just so people can get an idea of the story as it developed. Sure, that's great. Um, so I knew Jim. Jim was my youth pastor growing up back in Kentucky. And so we've had a relationship for... I mean, years and years and years, came out 10 years ago to be the first campus pastor of the first offsite campus that we launched. And so was there and walked through tons of challenges and tough stuff together, was a campus pastor up in the mountains for about, I don't know, five, six years, yep. and then kind of started picking up. We launched more campuses. And the way I say it is when you're first, people assume that you're best. And so they had me lead the campus pastors. I was just the first one there. And so led campus pastors. And uh, eventually in that season of unhealth, um, joined the lead team right before, as Jim mentioned, he went on his sabbatical. I joined the lead team, I think, three months yeah, before three that. Months. There were four people that reported to Jim on the lead team. And so just, uh, I mean... It was a rocket ship for a while, and then we plateaued, and then we had all this internal criticism of, like, what's happening? Why aren't we growing? Why are we doing the th things the way that we're yeah. doing things? And then joining the lead team, I remember hearing all that chatter, and what I would say is, hey, I trust the lead team, and I trust leadership. I trust like that these guys, and these are questions above my pay grade, and I joined that team, and I remember going oh man, now these things are at my pay grade and I've actually got to have the conversations and I'm part of the people responsible for it. And so it, it was a wake-up call for me. And then now um, after Jim's sabbatical, about I think a year later, I stepped into the executive lead pastor role. Yeah. So you became executive lead pastor exactly when, we're going to get into Jim's sabbatical sure. in, in a little bit in the, the tumult that Flatirons went through, but just to, to paint this out, when, when did you step into that role, Jesse? Stepped into that role a year and a half ago, I think. Yeah, so it was right. about a year, it was uh, beginning yeah. of 2021. Yeah. So as you were coming back, is that right, yeah. Jim? Have I got that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. When, 
again, not to jump ahead in the story, but coming back, we knew that things could not go back to the structure, the culture, the, the, the paradigm and the, and the dynamics. It, it was just one of our first learnings when we got into sabbatical, because we had a culture leading up to that, is all blame goes up. Mm-hmm. It all gets pushed up and it all lands mm-hmm. on my desk. I, I, always, I always say this, um, is that when everything's going great at your church, who gets the praise and glory? God, right? Yeah. When things are not going well mm-hmm. at your church, who gets the, the blame? Not God, right? It's like, right. It, land, it lands on my desk, right? And so we had a whole culture of, it's the leader, it's the leader, it's the leader. And five minutes mm-hmm. into, when I'm after sabbatical and lead team and elders, they start meeting together with staff. And then we, we brought an outside counselor in. He's like, this is broken from elders to facilities. Mm-hmm. This, mm-hmm. this, is, this wow. is a mess. And, and when I heard about that, I kind of felt good. It's like, so I'm not the only screwed up one. <laughs> There's some comfort in that. So let's start to unpack that a little bit. We have you on the executive team now, you know, the executive pastor for Flatirons, Jesse, Jim, you're the lead pastor, and your church stops growing. What did that start to do to you on the inside, Jim? Oh, I think I can speak for all mankind. You have a voice in your head that says, see, (laughs) you're not enough. And it was a matter of time until they found out. And so it just it just makes you question that. And so, and again, I think I can speak for most mankind is, is that the way that you compensate for that is you just buckle down and just work harder. And so I would, I would describe the year, especially the year, maybe a year and a half leading up to sabbatical as every day was a panic. Every day was like, like tightness, like, Oh no, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And there's a really dark side, you know, that you look back and go, yeah, I said that. Yeah, I did that. Like, as, as, a, as a senior leader of a, of a church, nobody will say this out loud, but when you get put in a corner, here's what you're thinking. I built this. Just shut up and do what I told you to do, right? Mm-hmm. You wouldn't be here without me. I, now, that's horrible, but this is what goes through. Like when somebody yeah. goes, like a, a campus leader says, I don't know, I'll check and see what, if that works for our campus. And I went, your campus? You don't have a campus. You're under budget, you're understaffed, you're over budget. I have to raise all your money. You don't exist without me. So don't question my direction. That's really sick, okay? But it is, it's the yeah. panic. It's the panic is like, hey, the, the, Formula worked for 10 years. Mm. So obviously, I know what I'm doing. Get on my page. Get on my boat. Get on my bus, whatever that is. And if you don't, because I'm so scared, but scared's coming out as anger, I, I had a reputation as the buzzsaw. And, uh, and in, in the right moments, like there was an infamous moment. It was the Tuesday before Easter, which is always an easy week in church world, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and always. so we were going through the weekend service for Easter at all of our campuses, and I kept getting like, well, that didn't happen. Well, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And Carrie, I, I, it's like I, I just worked my way through a room and pointed out the incompetencies in the room. My data might have been correct on some level. It was hateful. It was angry. It was... Can you can you describe what happened? And this is what is so remarkable about this story is normally what happens is you get into a toxic situation, which you did at Flatirons. You go on sabbatical right off into the sunset and somebody else tells the story about how terrible it was. What's remarkable about this is you're both in leadership. You went through a journey. You're, you're healing and you're starting a new day. I just want to make yeah. that clear. A little bit of a, you know, what do you call it? Spoiler alert, spoiler alert. No, you guys. So you are describing your own leadership. Yeah, you don't have a podcast about take us guys into that. that it's still horrible, Gary. You don't, that, that, nobody does that podcast, right? So there is a good redemptive story yeah. coming, I promise. There is a redemptive story, but usually it's written by someone else. Yeah. It's very rare for a leader to come back and be able to lead. And and I had, you and I were talking before we started recording, 
I had a similar thing where I burned out and perhaps we didn't get to the level of desperation in our church that, that you guys may have seen in yours, but like I was heading there. I was, I was all of that. And the last 16 years for me has been a story of redemption and continued redemption and continued learning. But I'd love for you to go to that Tuesday. So you're, you're shooting down ideas or what's happening as, or you, you go ballistic on the team? Like, what well, happened? It, it was like, I remember talking to a counselor one time that I stuff a lot of uh-huh. emotions, and then who, I put them in a closet, and then whoever happens to be the, the victim who does the last straw gets the whole closet, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? And so it was uh, years and months of pent-up vomiting of emotion, you know? It was like, and, like, and, 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 and you haven't done this over and over and you've done this and you, uh, every time I ask you to do this and how about that thing two months ago when, I mean, I'm pulling stuff out of and you remember the time that you did this and I'm working through and I'm basically saying, you don't exist without me. How dare you question my leadership, you know? Like, I, I mean, it was. Jim, I remember being in the meeting and uh, I mean, you, you said to one of our campus worship leaders, it's not your campus. Because she said, oh, well, we'll see if that works at my campus. And you said, it's not your campus. They're my campuses. And we had the campus pastors lined up and the worship team and interns in there. And it was just this moment where, like, I mean, I like, Carrie, I went back to my office and Jim and I talked about this. I talked to him afterwards, but I was like, I broke down crying because like, Jim has been one of my heroes from youth group. He was my youth pastor, baptized me in the ocean when I was in ninth grade. And I'm seeing this leadership and seeing Jim be a leader that he's never been in a leader that like, I don't know. I knew he didn't want to be. And at the same time, there was something was, something was wrong. And now I can look back and say, imagining the pressure that Jim felt Scott's left. We've plateaued. Easter's got to be amazing. He's got all these ideas for it in the worship team and different teams are resisting the ideas. And he's just like, and they're not feeling that pressure. Does that make sense? All that pressure right. is what Jim's feeling. And we weren't having any of these conversations at the moment yeah. either. And it's cumulative. It's not like I, I got put on sabbatical because of a Tuesday. It's like in this mindset, every time somebody said, or what about this? I heard it as a like a boom, you know, like, like you, you're incompetent. You don't know what you're doing. It's like, like questioning everything. And so I'm, I, I'm like, just do, just do what I'm telling you to do because everything, like my identity felt like it was at stake. Mm. If, if this doesn't go well, it's, this is about, you guys are all right. I, I should ride off into the sunset because it's a matter of time till they pull me aside and go like, thanks for your time, but you're not any good anymore. And I've, I, I, 34 years, right? 34 years, I, I've served the church and I've served it well. I got, I got a raise every year of my life for 34 years until that year. I, wow. right? I, I neglected my family for the church for 34 years and got patted on the back for it, right? Now, my family and I, we've been in counseling, but everything said, the one thing you're good at my wife has is bipolar. I can't fix that, right? Um, I, I don't know how to parent sometimes. I don't know how to do that. I was in a financial mess in debt years ago, right? I don't know how to do that. You know what I'm awesome at? I can preach and I can lead a church or a youth ministry, whatever. I'm good at that. And now the one thing I think I can do well, every voice in my life is saying, you're not that great. And now all my fears of going, then what am I? And what do I have? And so... I just lashed out, like, do what I'm telling you to do. And now looking back, it was all fear, but it came out as anger um, because anger isn't weak. Fear is weak. <laughs> so we'll go there. You, you know got I mean? put on sabbatical, which is, which is quite a dynamic in and of itself. But you, you raised something I did want to talk about because, you know, and some of it's autobiographical. You mentioned identity. Mm. How much of your identity was tied up in the growth of Flatirons and the success of your leadership at Flatirons. Looking back on it now and knowing what you know now, how were your identity and success entangled, Jim? I, I think it'd be easier to have said what wasn't, <laughs> what wasn't connected to that. I, I, I don't, I don't know, 
that that was the one thing I could say, like, I know I do this well. Look at the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Look at the baptisms. Look at the growth. Look at the, the influence. You know, look at the staff count. Look at the, you know, and just, just the ripple, like, and it came back to, I, I, I'm good at something. I'm really good. And then when all that kind of like doesn't happen, it comes back in going, I, then where does that leave me? Who am I? What, what do I, what am I? Like, what do I have left? If I'm not the lead pastor at Flatirons and Flatirons isn't as successful by all the measurements that we all measure church's success by, then I, I don't know what I have left. I mean, I knew my wife loved me. I knew my kids loved me, you know, but I'm talking about that core part of me. And I, I could preach a sermon that answers this for everyone else. Yes. You yes. Know. And you probably did. Is in you Christ, did. Right. You know, yeah. and I, I'm, a, I'm yeah. created in the image of God. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But what if you're, what if you're, what if you're, you think other than, other than, other than my family, this is my other love. And it doesn't, doesn't feel like it wants me anymore because I'm no good at it. And so I, I am in a panic just trying to like uh, make it work again. I need to make it work again. And that's, you, can't, you can't operate from that. It's exhausting. And then it spirals. And so I began to withdraw from the staff. Mm -hmm. Like I traveled more. I went on trips with my friends. I, 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 I had some staff people that... I, I'm gonna say I, I abused. Here's what I mean by I use them almost as hitmen. Just go take care of this. Okay. Go do this. Yeah. Right. So I didn't. Ab I, I. You didn't kill anybody. <laughs> you didn't kill anybody. Thank you. I, I, I thought. I thought about <laughs> it. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's probably for later. <laughs> but uh, um, I can't go to. I can't go to jail for what that can I for saying I that? So. anyway anyway uh, I know. I know. Prison, um, you know no it was it was like I <laughs> I use people and out of their love for me and mm -hmm. trying to honor me and respect me they would do anything I told them to do and they just mm -hmm. went out and just you know took people out of the knees for me uh -huh. you know and they were hit, they were hitmen it's like Jim because Jim said so yeah and I'm kind of his strong arm and. And I would say at the time, the staff, the leadership team, everybody was pulling back from Jim as well. And so it started this kind of cycle of Jim would pull back, so the, the staff would pull back from him, and Jim would pull back more, and the staff would pull back. And so eventually, like, I mean, Carrie, we had people who would look at me and say, well, Jim's not my pastor. And they, wow. they work for the church. They pulled a paycheck from our church, and at the same time, they would say, Jim, he's not my pastor. And so there was a lot of division amongst the staff as well, a lot of resistance that I think Jim would look back and say, well, this just proves my point, right? Mm, sure. Mm. So let's, let's pick up the story. You got put on sabbatical. You had that terrible Tuesday, again, before Easter, irony of ironies, right? The time we were supposed to be celebrating the most is this, this bad day in church history, your history, what happened next, Jim? Oh, <laughs> after that, because we had a great Easter. We had record numbers, and it was like, yay. So it reinforced <sighs> there you go. everything yep, I did. There it is. See? Huh. Right? It, it worked. It worked. They all towed the line. They got their crap together. They pulled together the, what I had asked for, whatever that is, on a certain level. And it was such a powerful Easter. And on Easter, I'm like, see? Y'all just do what I tell you to do. We get wow. 33,000 people, you know? And, oh. and it's like, and that's not good. And so I just keep on doing what I'm doing. And, and at that time, I, I don't know, because I've totally disconnected with staff. And I've either intimidated them or hurt them. And so now there are pockets of staff which are actually gathering um. And now it's, 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 it's taken on that toxicity of it's us against him. And, and, then, and, and then I had, uh, Jesse's a young leader, okay, who works for a stronger leader who works for me. And he's new in his role. What's he going to do? You know, there's a, there's a see, here's what no lead guy wants to talk about. We just go, oh, no, that's not true. There's an imbalance of power, Right? All right, it's not 
Not, right. not from my right. perspective, so you think because I'm equal, at the top of the food but... chain, all right? So I can say, right, I can say, absolutely, we're, you know, we're brothers in Christ. Just come talk to me. My door's always open. Come on, no, I'm not going to walk into the principal's office and ask a question and look incompetent or insubordinate or have him do what I heard he did to somebody else. It's just not going to happen. So it doesn't matter what Jesse's witnessing. As a junior leader in our organization at that time, he's not going to push back against me or, right? And so now pockets of toxicity are starting to take place. And we start doing things like anonymous staff polls, right, and surveys and best workplace uh, practices and all, all those kind of things. And, and the information keeps com starts coming back in. And because this is how scared my lead team was of me. They had the results of the staff survey for two weeks and didn't give it to me. Until Memorial Day, Monday night, they emailed it. My, my XP emailed it to me. So I've held on to this for a couple of weeks. It's, it's pretty bleak, and I was nervous to give it to you, but, but here it is. And then 30 minutes later, the chairman of our elders says, We need to meet with you in your office tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. And at 8 30, I was that, on Just to timeline this, this is in 2020, 2021. When was it? Yes, yeah, so this is three. 20, 2019. 2019. Memorial Day, 2019. Yeah, everybody talks about 2020 and COVID just being hard. <laughs> 2019, <laughs> COVID wow. was like vacation. <laughs> so in 2019, so you've been in decline, you you kind of resurrect things, you have the best Easter ever, and then they walk in and go, Jim, the jig's up. Yeah, I get a, I'm up at the cabin with my wife and I get this survey and I'm kind of glance at it and then I get a text message from uh, our chairman of the elders and I'm like, okay. Yeah. And- I, I didn't see it coming. I didn't. And so uh, I walk in the room and it's empty. I'm like, okay, I thought we started at seven or something like that or eight. And then the door opens, that door right there opens and in walk all my elders and walk in my lead team in a single file. They circle around. the. They all have envelopes in their hand. They sit down and they start reading that I'm on sabbatical. And they start using words like uh, unhealthy, uh, exhausted, um, uh, we're worried about you. Here's a list of things that, uh, that we're concerned about. Uh, we're going to put you on a six month sabbatical. You'll have zero contact with the church, zero contact with social media. You and your wife are going to go to this, uh, marriage camp. Uh, it, was, it just went on and on. You're going to get a medically. We want you to do the, all this kind of stuff. And, uh, in two days we have tickets booked for you and Robin to go visit, uh, one of our best friends down in Mexico City, who's also one of my spiritual directors, we, you're, you're going to go to Mexico City for, for, for a week. And I'm like, what? And I didn't fight it. I couldn't breathe. Yeah, like, yeah. This, I've seen this show. It's called Intervention. They all walk in with letters, right? Circle the table. And then you're, you're, your butt's on a plane to rehab, all right? I'm like, what's happening? And like, yeah. And, and I, I will say this, is like, it's the first time those words were ever spoken to me. I we're concerned about you. Um, we think you're exhausted. You're unhealthy. That's the first time those words were ever spoken to me. The closest thing was Jesse came in to me after that Tuesday pre-Easter meeting and went, that, 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 was, that was wrong. That was weird. And of course, I didn't really listen. And that's what people ask me all the time is like, would you have listened to anybody before you went on sabbatical? And I don't know. I don't know. The, the headspace I was in, I, I don't yeah. know that I would have listened to anybody's coaching. I, we, we did sabbatical. If we write a book, the elders and I, if we write a book, our book would be how not to put somebody on sabbatical because we did everything wrong. It was the right thing to do. And, and God used it for a great, but we, we did everything wrong. So looking back, and even in our, in our personnel stuff today, uh, in, in current day, and we talked about this on retreat earlier this week, is I don't know how I responded, but it would have been really helpful to, for them to be able to look back and go, yeah. no, we talked to you here and here and here and here. And when I would articulate, wow. like, how am I unhealthy? People would just say, well, you just are. Well, how long has this been going on? Like, up for a while, right? And all of a sudden, I'm just cut off from the church and staff and and it's like don't come back in the building for six months. And you're floored. So you did not see it coming. 
No clue. <laughs> no. Which is probably why I didn't fight back. Because all my emotions come out as anger. I couldn't breathe. I'm like, I was just like, okay. And I went home and just sat on my couch and just, wow. just broke down. So looking back, like, you know, you got a lot of hindsight now. And we're going to get to that. But if you had mm-hmm. met you, like, what were you thinking that day, were you thinking, good, I got it back. Like, I've, you know, we just had this record Easter. I got control of this thing. Like, what was your level of self-awareness? Did you realize you were inflicting the damage that you were inflicting? I'm just trying to get a sense because I think a lot of us, you know, my burnout, I did have people come to me and say, hey, you're going to burn out. And I'm not sure that this is the healthiest type of leadership for our church right now. And I just ignored it. And you know, then I burned out and it was like, oh crap, here we go. And, you know, I've, I've spent the last 16 years reconstructing, rebuilding leadership and my understanding of it. And, you know, here we are. But I would say my self-awareness was fairly low. Like I kind of knew, but not really. What, what about you? Like, did you know that you were unhealthy? Uh, hindsight, yes, of course. Uh, in the moment, yeah, it didn't matter. I, I still had to perform. Does that make sense? It's like, I I can't even entertain that that I'm not healthy because Saturday night, I have to walk up six steps, turn right, and face cameras. And nobody gets paid. Nobody gets health insurance. Nobody makes their mortgage. If I don't walk up six steps on that steps, turn right, and deliver the goods. And and everybody kind of knew that. So they they didn't want to mess with the formula. Because when I say that we plateaued, we're still in the in the teens of thousands, you know, we're still like, we're still rock yeah, and rolling. Yeah. The people in the church, they, they, they might've sensed and going, ah, he's, he's talking kind of angry out there today, you know, but it came off as passion. But, <laughs> but people in, on staff that was sitting there going, I know what he means by that. Mm. I know what he means by that. But the, tr- the truth is, I, it, every blame got pushed on me, but also the responsibility of carrying the place got pushed on me. And so it doesn't, it doesn't matter if, it didn't matter if I said I was unhealthy or not. I still had to show up Saturday night and deliver the goods. And so there was no margin for even to go. There was no margin in my life for any type of self-inventory. I was always just reacting to the crisis around me and sermon prep. That's, that's all it was. And it was exhausting. You said something really interesting that you just snuck in there. And I want to go back and revisit that that you felt the anger, but it comes across as passion. I think there might be more truth to that than most of us want to admit. Especially when I say over and over, hey, I'm not angry. This is passion. (laughs) (laughs) If you say that seven times, it might be anger. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. But it's funny, you know, Jim, you're making some really important observations about the justification we can make as leaders Mm. for our dysfunction, for the pressure we feel. Like nobody understands the pressure I'm under. Nobody understands being responsible for 15, 20,000 people. Nobody understands payroll. Nobody understands. And then my anger, and it worked. Like there's, there's, there's a toxic cocktail in that that keeps blowing up in the church. Do you have anything else you want to add while we're on that part of the story? Because I think there's a lot of insight there. Yeah, so I think if you were just analyzing everything I said, and I think that maybe there's some people, some guys in my position, ladies in my position, leaders in my position, and they're sitting there going, I know exactly how that feels. Yeah. But to the observer, I, I feel like you would judge this kind of a person as just being arrogant, narcissist. It's all about me, it's all about me. Listen, it comes from a noble place. It really does. In the moment, I, I, if I don't do this, not only does this, this place falls apart. How many people go to hell, right? I mean, this is yeah. like, like I, this, is the, this is the body of Christ, but God's dependent upon me, and I am not delivering. And so you guys got to help me deliver because I'll let God down, I'll let people down, uh, souls down, all this. Kind of, it comes from a noble place. And so this, it, it sounds like I'm going, I'm the rock star here. I'm, 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 the, I'm the one making hay. I'm, I'm the goal, right? And it's like, and it's a really fine line, but it comes from a noble place. None of us got in it to be rock stars, right? But then you have rock star yeah. pressure on you. 
right? And so you it's do. like you get lost in there sometimes. And so I just want to say to the person out there going, I feel that pressure. I feel like everybody's dependent upon me, all right? It comes from a noble place. I'm not letting us off the map because it comes yep. out really bad. But it, I, it starts, and, and we keep on trying to go back to, but I'm trying to serve God here. I'm yes. trying to serve people, love people well, right? It, and then the more you, it doesn't feel like it's working, the more you panic. And so it spirals. Does that make you, sense? You feel trapped, don't you? Oh, it gosh. does make sense, Jim. And, lonely. and I think, you know, for argument, yes. So for argument's sake, you know, there are definitely probably pastors who got in it for all the wrong reasons and it was a personal brand building thing or whatever. But I think there's way more noble purposes, good heart. They're surprised by the growth. They get trapped by the growth. They feel the pressure. All the toxins rise to the surface and, and they, they come out. And you said it was lonely. What were oh, your so my, friendships? When I was in ninth like? grade, my dad got fired. He was a pastor. He got fired. And so what goes in my computer is, don't show your weakness, man, because they will use it against you. Like Everybody in my atmosphere works for me. Right. They're an employee. Who am I going to look at and say, I don't know if I can, I'm doing this right. I feel like I'm failing because then they're, they all work for me. You know, and it's like, where do you go? And there's a certain level you can say to your wife, and then she's going like, are you, you okay? <laughs> are you going to, like, are you, healthy? right? And so it's like, yeah. you just stuff it in. You stuff it in, and like, I, I, can't, I can't show that I'm afraid. I can't show that I think I'm failing. I, I, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to panic and plow on. And it, it gets, and it just it es escalates. Trapped is a word I think you, you use. Yeah. I'm trapped. I, I can't get off this thing. And God took me off on a, took me off the treadmill on a Tuesday morning, kicking and screaming. Where and I didn't Jesse, fight back in the moment, you. but You're I found my legs. Patient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we'll, we'll talk about that. I want to talk about what it was like to get that intervention. But I want to ask this question, and then I want to talk to Jesse for a second. Where had the elders not intervened that morning, where would this have gone? Where would the dominoes have fallen? Would you have had an affair? Would you have blown the church up? Would you have imploded? Like, wh wh what would have happened? Oh, wow. Um, I, think, I think staff would have quickly just started exiting. Uh, and then I would have spiraled more. And then uh, I think all the things that you just mentioned are possible for any man. Cause I could say like, no, I've, 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 I've never done that before. Like, but I, I, nobody ever had, you know, had the affair, got the DUI, you know, yep. did the whatever, right. Nobody planned on doing that. But in that Correct. panic, you're just not, not saying, you're just not thinking right. Because, you know, I think you used the phrase earlier. What was I thinking? You're not thinking right. <laughs> and so correct. your entire compass is off, right? You're, you don't know where North is. And so I, I don't know. I, I think that the way I am wired, Carrie, I would have I would have said, if I can't win there, then screw it all. I'll win over there, you know, and whatever that would take to go like, see, you are enough. And there's a list. And there's a list of pastors that we can all name, just start checking off one after another going, yeah, they were failing there, therefore they went over there. And for 10 minutes, they felt like a winner. And it ruined their whole life, right? So um, I, God pulled me out of this before that. So, you know, the, the cool thing about, and then I'll, let, I'll, I'll shut it for a while. The, the cool thing about this is from that initial meeting with the elders and the dozens of meetings that happened over the next six months together, in counseling together, in therapy together, in in one on ones, all that kind of stuff. There was one mantra that came over and over and over, and it's the only way I think I made it. And that was the phrase, "So that you can come back and lead." So it was always understood. That's what the elders said to you that day, right? From day one, I didn't hear it day one, yeah. Yeah. right? 
I didn't hear it, but they articulated from day one so that you can come back, so that you can come back over and over and over and over. I remember one time I, one of our elders was over the house and I was throwing a fit about some decision that they had made. And he said, he says, why does that bother you so much? I said, because I lead flat irons. And he says, you don't right now. And I, 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 I'm like, it's like, go ahead and kick me in the stomach, man. You right? But it was an <laughs> aha moment. Like, hey, you're in timeout for a reason. And you've got to lean into this instead of stop fighting it. And we'll get more into that. But that, that is, I think, for most leaders out the pastors, they hear the word, they put me on sabbatical. You mean they started me towards the exit door? Yeah. Right? Because yeah. The, yeah. the the agenda behind most sabbaticals is a soft firing, right? And this was never that. This was always so that you can come back. And whether I heard it or not, you play the tapes, you read the notes, so that you can, so that you can come back. And eventually, I started believing that. So you feel trapped, Jim. You're doing whatever you feel is in your power to try to get it back to where it was. Yeah. You're yeah. pretty, you're reasonably unaware of how bad the situation has gotten. And you had no idea your elders were about to order you onto sabbatical. Jesse, how did yeah. it feel for you and for the rest of the team? Because I think one of the significant issues we have in leadership is our self-perception is often at odds with how others experience us or see us. So, you know, what was it like for you guys who weren't Jim to be under Jim's leadership leading up to that moment? Sure. Um, I remember a couple weeks ago, Jim and I were talking and Jim was just like, Jesse, I was honestly completely shocked when they walked in. And my internal response was, how did that surprise you? You know, the way that you were leading in the moment wow. was like, I can, I can we have a time you. out? So, um, <laughs> but, but for, for me, just watching it and watching this pattern, they, I, I remember some creative director talking about, they call it a crap cake. And it's this idea of you serve the cake on East, most Easter's are crap cake. It looks beautiful. It's amazing, but it's filled with crap to make it happen. You know, in oh. this idea of like, that was what Flatirons felt like for a season. And it was, uh, it was devastating to watch. And at the same time, we needed more of Jim's presence. We needed more of Jim's leadership and, and really his pastoring. And Jim is, Jim's pulling away. And when Jim is engaging with us, it's not, it didn't feel like as a pastor, you know, I'm, I'm trying to carry the, and Jim and I, we've talked about this before. I feel comfortable saying it, but it felt like it, there, there was a tyrant who would come in and say, this is what I want you to do. Just do it. And, um, and there was so much dysfunction among our staff, the conversations that would have. And what we realized, what we realized when Jim left and when Jim was placed on sabbatical was the loneliest season of my life. I had I had my first and only panic attack where we were trying to do flooring in my house. And I just started, I couldn't figure out how to measure something. I started crying. I told my wife, Kara, like, I don't know what's wrong with me. And I just had to go sit in the garage for an hour. Um, it was so lonely. And we had, all, we had pointed all the fingers at Jim, like, Jim's the problem. Jim, Jim's responsible. Jim, if Jim's out, we're going to be fine. This is going to be okay. And we wanted to show Jim when Jim got back from his sabbatical six months later, man, look what we've done with healthy leadership at the church. And it was one week in, and I just remember going like, Jim, Jim wasn't the only problem. The, the, there was a problem among all the staff, the way that we treat each other. And there was this pressure that was on Jim that was now on me and the rest of the leadership team. And I felt a fraction of the weight that Jim was feeling in that moment. I was like, oh, this is what it feels like for Jim to carry what he's been carrying in the weight of the organization. And, um, and man, it was, it was lonely. And when I found myself um, leaning into controlling people, that's when I know something's unhealthy. You know, like there, there's that book, Love and Respect. Jim and I were talking about this, Love and Respect. They say, typically, women need love, men need respect. If I can't get your respect, I'm going to try to control you because at least I get what I want done. And um, respect for me, ultimately, 
respect can be earned and deserved. What I really wanted underneath that respect was actually love. I wanted people to just love me for, does that make sense? For Not for what I did, but just for who I am. But when you're in a certain position of leadership, everyone relates to you, not in a, I love you unconditionally, but there is a little bit of, I love you because of what I expect out of you, or because you act a certain way, or because I rely on you. And so that period was a period of loneliness and stress. And honestly, like, Carrie, to be honest, there, there was also a little bit of refreshment to go, man, we're, we're getting to step in leadership again and make some decisions that we weren't able to make at the time beforehand because Jim was making all those decisions. Jim, it's the day of your kind of like comatose. You're like, did this just happen? What were the emotions that happened in the hours and days and weeks following your forced sabbatical? What's going on inside uh, you? We talked about this a while back. I felt like part of me died that day. I, I, I felt like death. I'm, I'm, I'm laying on a bed going, it felt like a funeral. It felt like the death of every dream, every hope, shame, embarrassment, um, You know, throughout throughout sabbatical, people ask, "Did you ever think about quitting?" And it's like there's fleeting thing, you know, fleeting moments of like, "Well, you know," right? But I never never felt like quitting. My biggest question is, how would I, how do I ever go back and face everybody? You know, and it's like, but what Jesse just said, I, through counseling, I one of my shadows, whatever it is, the I for a season of my life, I'm convinced or I've been convinced. The only reason people love me is because I produce. Oh, wow. And the moment I don't produce, God will find somebody who can. And he'll just move me out, and they'll just move me out, and then they'll bring in the next widget to do what I do, you know? And uh, and that felt like, yeah, God, you're just moving on, right? Church, you're just moving on without me. Thanks for your time. Bye. And I felt like I felt like death. Um, you know, my... My wife didn't try to fix me. She just listened to me and held me. She didn't say like, well, have you thought about this? She didn't give me any, any suggestions. I couldn't have heard him anyway. She just was with me, you know, and, and James and Aaron down in uh, Mexico City where we ended up with, you know, he looked at me and he said, Jim, I don't care what you've done. I love you and I'm, I'm here for, for you. Uh, and he didn't know any of the details really at that point. Um, I, just, I just needed unconditional love and some space. space. Um, it was weird. I showed up in Mexico City, and they were starting a new cohort. And the guy that was leading the cohort uh, is a missionary from Spain. He, uh, I didn't even want to go to church, but they told me that come over, come over. It's Mexico, so everything's on different time, right? right. Come over at noon. We'll, the church will be over. It meets at their house, uh, and we'll have dinner, and then we'll go on with the day. And so we got there at ten after twelve, and church was just starting. And I'm like. Great. All right. So of course I'm not going <laughs> to go in the house and ignore all these people because yeah. because I've been there before on mission trips and stuff, you know, and they all knew I was. So, but I'm sitting on the back row and Robin makes up one half of a song in Spanish. And we don't even speak Spanish. She has to go in the house because she's in tears, and I'm in the back. And I'm crying. I don't know what we're talking. Si, señor. And I'm just like crying, you know. And and uh, and then the missionary gets up and he's and he and uh, he's he's. He, um, wow, he, he teaches on um, Matthew 11, Jesus is saying, you know, you've hidden some things, Father, you've hidden some things from some people, and you revealed to other people, but now I'm going to reveal them to you, to these people. That's a paraphrase. And then the next, so whatever he says next is, I'm going to describe God for you. And he goes into it, come unto me, all you who are weary. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This is what you're going to teach on. Come on to me who are weary and exhausted and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, and then it goes on. It says, for I am gentle. He's, he's describing God, right? I am gentle and humble in heart. And I cry bullshit, you know? <laughs> you're not gentle. This is, this, this, of all the words, you're holy, you're righteous, you're definitely just, you know? You're really mean right now, but humble and gentle is like, and I, it just overwhelmed me. So... 
so, but when I got home from Mexico, I got online and I found a yoke, an Amish yoke that was 200 years old. And I, and I ordered it and I took it up to my cabin and I nailed it to the porch wall and put a plaque under it with that verse. And for the next three months, I just, it's like, and God was so gentle, you know? And, and you know, I don't think about God being gentle and humble of heart, you know? I think about him being holy and all that. Kind of but he just, I yelled at him and I stomped my foot and I told him to give me my church back and he told me it's not your church and we'll get to that later but um, yeah it was rough it was death it was pan it, it, I, I don't want to say relief because I didn't feel relief at all it's just like I, that I don't know what to do I, I have no idea what to do they didn't articulate to me if they said on Thursday you did this stop doing that I could have corrected that. But basically, it was, you're just a wreck. Like, like what did I do? You just are. So I, I asked Jesse, asked, this is a conversation where I said, what did I, what did I do? I asked him this a couple of months ago. What did I do? It wasn't that meeting that says, there, let's, let's put his butt on sabbatical. And Jesse looked at me and went, it just all happened on your watch. And my aha moment was, it's not all my fault. It was my responsibility. And I didn't lead well. Yep. I, I pushed it out, pushed it down. If everybody's pushing it up, I was pushing it down, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, or if I was pushing it up, I said, God, you need to do your job better here because I'm, I'm showing up every day, you know? And, but I, it was just like a time of not breathing. And... Um, Probably my best m metaphor for what God did during that sabbatical is the year before I'd gone to Scotland, and I love Scotland. I did that DNA test, and I'm 17% Scottish, oh, yeah. so I'm like Braveheart. And, but I remember, I remember driving around, and our tour guide pointed at one of those dry stack walls. You know, they, 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 they stack the stones from the field up, and they make all yeah. these walls. And he said, that, that, that wall's been there for, we estimate, 4,000 years. Wow. And I'm like, what? He says, oh, yeah, pre-Roman times, pre, you know, like, right. And I'm like, there's nothing being built in America that's going to be here 400 years from now, you know, let alone 4,000 years. Or, and so when I went on sabbatical, I'm like, well, it's just go away, just rest. And I've got a cabin up in the mountains. And so I said, I'm going to build a dry stack wall. Right? I got rocks. It's the mountains. I got rocks everywhere. And so I got online. I learned how to do it. I had a stonemason give me some tutoring. And for the next four months, I, I built a, a dry stack wall. And I lost count at 6,000 stones. Um, the, the first third of that wall is anger and bitterness. And every, every rock that I'm stacking up, I am rehearsing speeches of when I get back, I'm going to march in her office. I'm going to fling that door open and pack your stuff, girl, you know, yeah. and there's the door and I'm going to clean house. And I'm going to do this. All right. And, you know, and like, I've got, I've got 80 acres. I can hide bodies. You know, it's like, I, I mean, that was just like, <laughs> you're I, livid. They'll, they'll, I know what I, right. And, and then that middle two months, that's when I really started leaning into my work and started having some listening to God and listening to some spiritual direction, really digging into my counseling and, uh, and then those last two months, and the last third of that wall, was about grace, asking for and extending, extending grace. And the best picture I have, because there was no plan. After the fact, we found a great sabbatical and counselor. After the fact, we, we you know, found out that the whole, or, the whole organization is broken. After the fact, we realized that we don't even have a governance st structure, you know? We don't know what the relationship between here, here and here and here. I, I, we learned, all that was after, the, there was no plan. But God obviously has a plan. And my six-month sabbatical looks like this. The first third, descent. It's, 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 it's I'm, I'm, I'm stomping on my foot and telling God, not a good God, and those people are not good people, and, and, right, and it's descent. I was addicted to flat irons, and he pried it out of my fingers, right? He took it away from me. And again, I stomped my foot and told him, give me back my church. The, I did my work in the middle third, and then started reading that last, that last two months. Um, I had healing to do with my family. That I had injured, I'd injured my kids 
in the, our relationship. I didn't, I, I didn't, that. I wasn't paying attention to it. Um, wow. I, 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 I in, in a relationship with friends, as a matter of fact, I looked around and went, I don't, I don't have any really, I don't miss anybody. I, I just do church. Like, like I don't miss anyone. Right. Now I can say that there are a few I would, you know, but I, I, remember, I remember listening to, um, um, who's the Young Guns? Brad Lominick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brad Lominick talked about his eight, like his eight. Uh, and that was like, who are the eight guys you would, your pallbearers. Oh, yeah. And I came up with three and the rest were for me, you know? And it's like, ah, that, that's not good. Aha moments, though the biggest the biggest learnings from that. I'm jumping ahead. So, do you want to stop? Here's significant moments. I'm sitting on my couch every other week or once a week. I would spend time with James Henderson down in Mexico City, tight friend, uh, spiritual director in my life. And I and I said this. I said, "Hey, James, I don't know how much longer I can do this. I feel like I'm in a long dark tunnel." And I, every time I look down the tunnel, I just see more tunnel. And every time I see a light, I'm going, okay, maybe that's the light at the end of the tunnel. It's just one more freight train going to run me over. I'm, I don't know how long I can do this. And he said, why do you, he said, of course, the spiritual director doesn't give advice. He just asks questions. All right. He says, why do you think God still has you in that tunnel? And what is, what is, what is he, he might want you to learn? And, and it's like I'm trying to fight my way out of the tunnel, which is a control issue. And, and my aha moments, I mean, it's every once in a while, I think crystallizing going, I can give you three points right now. You know, this is one of those weird things. It's like, I, 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 know, I know what God's trying to teach me. This is not my church. It's his. Right. And I was operating like this is Jim's church, and everybody works for Jim. Right. So this is not my identity. I'm not in control. Control is an illusion. I don't control 99% of my life. I don't, I don't think I control one. I try to stay in shape, but if my self is crazy and start dividing, it's just going to do it. I don't care how much fiber you eat, right? I, I, I might make it home tonight if I drive careful, but I'm not in charge of this coming at me, right? I, I, I've tried to have a good relationship with my kids, but they have their own journey with God, right? And so I, I have, I, control is an illusion. And the more I try to control things, I find out, tell myself it's, I'm trying to help people or I'm trying to get us to their place. It's me. I'm trying, to, I like being a savior. Mm. Like, I like, I would never, I never admit that, you know, bailing out your kids or fixing everybody's problems. You want to say it's for their good because I love them. Man, no, you can be savior. And that feels good, right? There is one savior and that has been built, you know, and I ain't him. So control is an illusion. And the big one for me was at the end of the day, all that counts really is me and Jesus and me and Robin, because that's what it's supposed to be. And I would, I would always, I, I've never had an affair with a person. I've had an affair with the church. She's a really sweet mistress, and she makes me feel good. And she tells me I'm awesome. And all the other parts of my life are failing. She's sweet. You know, one of the reasons I'm so grateful to have this conversation is because there are literally hundreds of thousands of people who are deconstructing their faith right now. And I think in, in some measure, it's because of the kind of dynamics that we're talking about in this interview. And I'm so grateful for your just absolute transparency on this. But I want to talk to both of you about deconstructing the church leadership culture that produces the kind of toxins that you felt in 2019 that I felt at different points in my relationship, like with a little bit of distance in it now. How do you think you got there? How does, how does a growing church get that unhealthy. And we hinted at it a little bit, but, and then, and then I did definitely later want to talk about like having a healthier culture, but I just like to exegete that a little bit. Like what, what are the ingredients that allows us to, 
I think genuinely lead people to a relationship with Christ, but doing it in a way that is very unchristlike and treating people around us in a very unchristlike way. And I say this as somebody who has felt those times myself. Looking back on it, one thing is I don't think we ever tapped the brakes when it came to growth at Flatirons. It wasn't, we were never like, oh, let's try to go, let's try to grow until the very end there. It really was, growth was just happening. We got to respond it. So yeah, let's add a service. Yeah, let's do Saturday nights. Yeah, let's add campuses. Yeah, let's add staff. And I mean, our campuses, uh, that's what everybody was doing at the time. And so we had- You never heard the yep. seminar, seminar on you're going too fast to slow down. You never heard that. <laughs> yeah, that was that's never true. a seminar, right? And that's but, what we uh-huh. did. Right, and, and we just kept on going. And in our our bent, we're kind of like anti corporate. We're a rebellious church that way. And so, anytime we would introduce a system or a structure or anything that would actually help frame up the growth, our staff and ourselves would go like, "I think we're betraying our roots. I think we're not being flat irons. This is not flat irons because this feels like a system. This feels like a structure." And so, you have a hundred and 70 person staff, you've got five campuses, we've got 18,000 people with the structures and systems of maybe a church of three or 4,000 at the time. And so there, inevitably what's going to happen is all issues, all blame, all responsibility is just going to be pushed up and pushed up and pushed up and really was going to rest on Jim's shoulders to say, okay, this is on you. Let's hope that you produce. And if he didn't, or if he produced in a way that we didn't like or didn't make us feel good then we would say like, oh, there's got to be something wrong with Jim. And when, again, when Jim went on sabbatical, we realized, man, there, there's issues with all of us at the time. Yeah. What, what else would you say? Well, I, would, I would echo the same thing. It's like, again, no, nobody's going to ever say, you, you just need to take a breath and slow down. So like when I go work out at the gym, um, this is what everybody knows. Or you're a runner or a weightlifter or whatever it is, is like, you got to pace yourself or you're going to get injured, right? Long-term... Small gains long-term, not one big gain. You're not going to work out on Tuesday and all of a sudden look in the mirror going, wow, I can see a difference, right? <laughs> look what it's, happened to it's, me. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's 500 Tuesdays, right? And then you go like the cumulative effect. Otherwise, you're going to strain. We, we were, they were putting weight on the plate and we were straining, but we got the weight up every time, every time. And we got exhausted, right? We so I was on staff at a, at a really large church back in my youth ministry days. And we went from that, hey, the whole staff's in the room with the lead pastor around the table telling jokes, going on staff retreat, you know, playing you know, sports, all that kind of stuff. And when I left that church, it wasn't 35 people on staff, it was 400 people on staff. And there, were, there was an inner circle and there was a, a next circle and there was a next circle and it got really, really corporate. And so, and the, and the lead pastor was in a tower somewhere, right? So when I became the lead pastor here, I'm like, I don't want that. It changed us. And so the, the reality is, it, again, it sounds noble to go like, hey, we're as intimate and fun at 175 staff as we were at 30. Um, first of all, Jim, that's because you're not one of the 175. <laughs> you're one of the five. <laughs> So it still feels cool, cool and intimate to you. Everybody else is frustrated because they don't know what's going on. When we were 30 people, and I had an idea on Thursday or Friday for the weekend service on Saturday or Sunday, we could pivot like that. Because everybody was like real close, right? Now, it's like if I pivot 10 days out, it's, it's like, remember that, that game you used to play on the playground where everybody holds hands and the guy on the end swings all the way out? I turn left and it's easy for me. The guy on the left's going 75 miles an hour and he's like, ah! <laughs> right? And to me, it's like, isn't that a rush? No, it's not a rush. <laughs> right? Because they're going home and telling their families, oh, I'm not going to be home this weekend either. You know, because the do- I, I didn't know the dominoes. So communication was bad. Uh, and I think that... I think that we didn't guard our culture at all. No. In the early days, the culture just naturally grew up and grew in alignment. But uh, when we stopped growing, when we were so big, our culture overgrew. And we've always been, we'd say, like a fun staff and raw and real. And it overgrew into 
We're raw and real, which means say anything that you want about anybody that you want, and you're not going to get in trouble for it, and you're not going to get corrected. Or have fun at right. other people's expense. And so our culture overgrew, and that was something that we we had to correct, and we've been doing a lot of work on it, is pruning our culture back That's to good. be really what, what it was in the beginning and then what it grew out of. Yeah, we, we called our culture raw and real. Carrie, it was sin. And then oh, we'd call wow. sin is foxhole humor, right? It's just what we do mm. to, co- to cope with the stress and like that. Mm. It was sin. Mm. Like, th- I think that we, mm. I think that, and I hate to say this as a dad of a daughter, I wouldn't want my daughter on this staff. Oh, a young, you know, mom on this staff. I don't know. She would have felt safe because of the humor, right? Wow. And I and I was right in there with them. I I, I was part of some discussions going like. Are we even saved? You know, and it's like, oh, no, no, it's just our culture. We're just being raw and real and stuff like that. It's like, no, yeah. it, it, it was sin and, and it was gossip and it was divisiveness and, and it was destructive. And it was, and, and by that, I'm like, I don't think anybody was intentionally what, divisive. I think it was just like, there was no unity. Mm. Does that make sense? It was like yep. everybody, every man for himself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That might be a, a better word. It was uh, it was it was destructive, but we never would have called it that. We would have gone like, ah, eh, it's flatterers. <laughs> we're just kind of we're for church for lost and broken people, and you know we don't want to, you know. And so we were, and we were so non-confrontational. We were so non-confrontational at the moment that you would not call people out on talking about somebody that way. You would not call somebody out on they've got different ideas for ministry or the direction we should be headed or for leadership. And so what ended up happening was we had a hundred different opinions about this is what Flatiron should value. This is how Flatiron should do ministry. And so we were all working in opposite directions. And that's one of the things that I think was frustrating to Jim, but also just held us back from making progress is that we were all going our own directions. Yeah. So the cynics and the deconverted and the critics would perhaps argue that growth and scale and size almost always has an element of toxicity to it or a lot of toxicity to it. I'd love your take on that. Like, do you think it's inevitable that when you grow, you become unhealthy, that church growth is basically just a cancer? Or do you think it's possible that health and growth can coexist? I think if health and growth don't coexist, toxicity is inevitable. I I think that, remember when you were in junior high and you had a growth spurt and it just hurt? Yeah. You just hurt, okay? And so it's like, I think there's a reason why God says you can, you can only grow so fast. Right. And mm-hmm. there's there's gimmicks and there's tools and there's sticks and there's ploys or whatever you want. And you can escalate this thing. You can escalate growth really, really fast, right? But if your infrastructure and your communication structure and your level of trust within the organization, the people in the pews, the people in the auditoriums, they're not going to sense it until all of a sudden the, the bottom is falls out. And they're going like, what happened? Right? right? Most of my church didn't understand why I was on sabbatical. Sure. I mean, That's there was, true. and there were all kinds of polls out there. There were podcasts, the over under, what really is the story? And is Jim coming back? And I think I was in Vegas. I was, I was betting line in Vegas. Like, what's the, you know, it's like the rise and fall of Jim Bergen. It's like, listen, you, sorry, you put, you put that soundtrack in anybody's story and they're just a demon, but you probably have to edit that out. But I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, let me jump ahead. So we're now a church of 10,000 post COVID, right? That, that's, that's directionally, that's where we are going. Yeah. Right. I, and that's huge. That's bigger than the town I grew up in. Okay. <laughs> so it's not like we're going, we're just that. I mean, this is an enormous church, right? Yeah, it is. And we have a staff. What's our staff number now? A little over a hundred, a little over a hundred, less than half of those were pre sabbatical. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we now have a staff culture that I'm going to say, is it totally healed? There's still, there's still bits and pieces, but, but our, so we, the way that we do governance now around here is we have definitely ends that we're going for. Like we would like to see people be baptized. We'd like to see people take spiritual formation grows. We'd like to see these people in, in engage. So we have the, those normal ones, but now on one of ours, it, 
every year we're going to be me- measured on staff health mm-hmm. because staff health, this is going to sound really bad and everybody has to get counseling around it, but <laughs> staff health is as important as baptism numbers. Sure. Okay. Right. It's more p- important than attendance numbers. Because if Satan was really smart, he'd grow your church really, really big and then take you out of the knees. And then yeah. the domino of ripple effect takes out thousands more. And, right? Yeah. Does and that I make think, sense? I think that's mm-hmm. the, I think big church, small church, they can be healthy, they can be unhealthy. I just think that when a big <laughs> church is unhealthy, man, it just, it causes so much damage. And, and we still reflect on relationships with people that I had, like, a, a friend of mine, he's on our staff right now. He asked, I had a pastor, I, I grew up in a pastor's home and he just said, Hey, how did you grow up and want to go into ministry? And I was like, I had a great dad, great pastor, and I didn't experience church hurt. My dad didn't pass along his church hurt that he experienced by being a part of a staff onto me. Sometimes people, they cannot help passing along church hurt to their kids. You know, you get fired from a job immediately, unjustly, you're kept poor for so long, different things like that. But I just feel like Carrie, uh, there are probably dozens of people that look back on Flatirons and look back on their time at Flatirons, and it has caused church hurt and damage from being on staff here that we can't get back. And um, and I've tried to make some amends with that, and I've tried to do my best to repent of the ways that I contributed to it. And at the same time, um, what we can do moving forward is say we can't go back to that. We have got to be different moving forward. But like that's part of our story is that there are going to be people that point to me and point to Jim as part of their church hurt and deconstruction story. And um, I don't know, man, I'm, that, that's a struggle for me. Well, that's honest and, and that's real and that's vulnerable. And I think you raise a really good point. There are dysfunctional small churches, <laughs> you know, toxic <laughs> small churches. And yeah. there are unhealthy mid-sized churches. And there are, and this is the remarkable part of the story. And this is the hope. And this is one of the reasons. I mean, you did come back from sabbatical and you are still leading flat irons. Before we get there, Jim, I got to yep. ask you, the kind of pivot that you made in your whole approach to ministry, identity, life, humility, repentance, change, transformation. I mean, often, you know, this isn't your first rodeo. You've been in leadership a long time, but sometimes that can take 15 or 20 years for people to get that that far or to even have Honestly, what I what I would see is the humility to be able to have this conversation and go, yeah, that was me. Not that was me in the 80s. It's like, that was me 72 mm-hmm. months ago. It was pretty remarkable. How, how did that growth accelerate? And then what was it like coming back? Because as you said, the script changed from when mm-hmm. you were building that rock wall from, oh, I know exactly what I'm going to say to him, what I'm going to say to her to a very different ethos when you came back. Yeah. Um, Well, Gosh, I don't want to come across as like this pious sage who's like, I've been to the desert and this is what the Lord told me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that deep. I'm just not. (laughs) So I don't want to give myself too much. But the, the, the truth is... Flatirons wasn't my problem. I was my problem. Okay? Um, I, I used Flatirons to medicate my problem. Right? Am I enough? Am I okay? Am I, am I sufficient? Am I, where's my value? Like, like am I successful? I, it's like, those are, those are questions that can't be answered by that. And so until I, until I went, not my church, not my identity, and I got to get my priorities back in order, and that is I got to run after Jesus and my wife. And Flatters is on the list because it's not not important, but it's it's not the defining thing of my life. Now, once once I turn that corner, um, again, I don't want to paint myself 
And I came back and I was like, by golly, let's just all be collaborative and let's all just be like, hold hands and what, what do you want to do, all right? Because at the end of the day, on, I still have to walk up six steps, turn right and face tens of thousands of people yeah. with millions of dollars of equipment. It's like, and pay the bills and all that, right? So, but the, the difference was now I have, I have a truth to go back to that, that says, that's not who you are. That's not where you get your value. You, you don't have to control that. You have to, you have to release that. You have to play a longer game here. And when, so in the early days of a church, and we basically, when I got here, we restarted this. The DNA was the same, but we had to restart it, okay? So the guy at the end of the table in my position is the creative force, right? For the most part, right? Hey, I want to see this. This is my vision. This is our, my paradigm of ministry. This is like, hey, this is what I want our ethos of culture to be. He's the driving force. But a certain point comes that if if everybody's just looking at the end of the table for that, then that everybody else's creative vision atrophies. And now they just look at you going, just tell us what to do, right? And so if you raise your children that way, you know, my children can't make a decision without me. They still live at home in their 30s and 40s, and I still have to give them allowance. Then that's really, that's not because they love you. Because they've never learned how to be an adult, yeah. right? And it's like, so in parenting, you go like, I'm going to let my, my kid do this. This is not exactly how I would do it. And I'm not going to let him fail totally because there's too much at risk. There's too much at stake, right? But if I'm going to let him fail, I'm going to let him fail forward, all right? Because they'll get more muscle and they'll get more development, all right? And eventually, now they're a contributing force. I, I think I speak for every league guy out there. We, we have confidence that we can walk up those five steps, turn to right, and deliver the goods. We have confidence that God has gifted us or else we wouldn't be leading this, okay? But... What we have to submit ourselves to is that just because we have good ideas doesn't mean it's the best idea. And if we would throw our idea out there and then cultivate a culture where someone goes, hey, can I add to that? Or can I, can I tweak that a little bit? And not feel like, what? what's wrong with my idea? It's like, it leads to a better idea. It does. Now, a lot of times we come back to my idea because I've been doing this longer than most of the people in the room have been alive. <laughs> but I would say many, many, many times I, I can sit there going, and then I have to call this out as the, as the senior leader. I like your idea better than mine. And, and then they go like, huh? What? It's like, that, that's, that's because I don't have to control it. I was at a retreat yesterday with my lead team and my campus pastors, right? And we had the, the post-it notes up on the wall. Here are the issues. Here are the ideas. Here's the vision. Here's this, right, right? And I'm sitting there going, and at the end, we were debriefing the day. I went, there is a day. Because there were a lot, I had a list in my head of, this is new information to me. <laughs> I, I didn't know that happened because I've been on a six-week break. I come back in and I'm going, I didn't know we hired them. I didn't know we fired them. I, I didn't know we were going to have that. That's an event. Hmm. I'm, oh, I'm speaking at it. Well, good to know. I'm keeping all this in, right? There was a day when I would have looked at that list and I would have started shooting it down because it wasn't my idea. Oh, wow. It really was. Because I had to be perceived in my mind as the senior leader, right? And now, like, I'm going, that's awesome. That's good. Or, like, I, help me understand. I, I think we ought to do that. Help me understand. And so that's because I, of that. My identity is not at stake anymore. And I'm trying to develop leaders, right? This guy right here, I don't want to – every time I talk about Jesse, I just expect he's going to get recruited by every church in America. So – He's off limits, okay? So, I'm so for, I couldn't have come back without him. Without us having a really, really hard conversations of, about, mm -hmm. like, I looked at him a, a few months ago and I said, if you screw me, <laughs> I'm going to clean this up for your podcast. Yeah. If you screw me over, I don't have another one in me. I'm choosing to trust you. And I do trust him, and, and, he, and he's proven trustworthy. And, and he's had to make that decision back in, in my direction, too. Am I going to trust the leader that 
got put in timeout for six months because he was toxic and unhealthy. And, and so we, we, we have this cadence now of, of communication and trust and, 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 and honor. But because of that, like I have more healthy margin in my life. I have enough margin in my life that I had to have counseling around the guilt I had over margin. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> Tell us more about that. Like I, you know, here's the senior leaders. I, I need to be the first in the office and last yeah. to lead. Leave. Yeah, you really don't. You've just communicated and neglect your family. That's what you've communicated, right? Um, I need to be at everything every time or else it's not important. Like, if you're not at staff meeting, then Jim doesn't care, or this isn't really that important. I don't need to be there either, right? If Jim doesn't speak at it, it's not right. It's like, no, no, no. I had, when I got back from sabbatical, I had to discipline myself, because I wanted to empower Jesse and my lead team. We are leading, right? But if I'm in the room, everybody defers to me. So for this guy to be perceived as the senior leader, the number two guy, I can't be in the room. Right. And I'm sitting there going, what's everybody think about me? Does everybody think I don't care? Do you think I'm checked out on the staff? No, I need to, them to say, Jesse, what is, why is it Jim here? It's like, I'm here. Jesse needs to say, I'm here. Jim's here. We're here, right? And I had, to, I had to deal with that. It's like, what will people think about me? Will they think that I'm, you know, like whatever that is? Or so like I work, I work offsite on Monday because like I, I my, Monday is my big writing day. So I, I, I go to, I go off I, and I'm working, but I'm not working sure. here because here everybody goes, can I have five minutes? And there's your day. <laughs> right. So, so I work offsite on Monday. I, I come to one staff meeting a, a month usually and, and give a word or a word of encouragement, but the re all the staff meetings and we do a weekly staff meeting for, because we're, we, we still need that. We need to be in a room together. We're one staff, we're not five campuses, we're one church, right? And Jesse or one of the lead teams leads it, right? And then I show up and go, hey, right? Uh, so Tuesday is that day, and I'm flexible on Tuesday. Wednesday, this staff owns me. I'm in that meeting, that meeting, meeting. I'm present, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. Thursday is, is, is programming for two weekends, three weekends out from now. I, 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 on Thursday afternoon, we do a run-through of our service. I get my truck, and I don't come back on campus till Sunday, so Thursday afternoon through Sunday morning, that's my weekend, right? And, and I meet with the lead team in there, and I meet with Jesse in there, but Jesse is me. Our staff now sees when Jesse's here, Jim's mm -hmm. here. When the lead team's here, Jesse's here, which means Jim's here, right? And that has afforded me such margin. I just came off a six-week break. Six weeks. It's part of my sabbatical comeback. My leaders sat down and went, we want you to take a six-week block in the summer, and then another week in the fall, another week in the spring. You, and then, and then I, I, my, my preaching cadence right now is four on, two off. And I learned that from uh, yeah. Rochelle. Because when you do like three on, one off, you, you, you don't, don't unplug. Yeah. Right? But two, you do. Right? And so my, my, my goal is four off. Two. Now, seasonally, that's a little bit different. Like, we have some mission trips scheduled. I'm going to go tour mission things uh, or maybe lead between Easter and, and my sabbatical. I might go a little bit heavy because I'm going to be sure. gone so much. But that's another thing. Um, I, I'm possibly looking at, at succession maybe five years from now. We're already planting seeds wow. about that, which means I have to wean this church off me. Does that make sense? Like I am the primary voice. Most of the people at Flatirons came to Christ because they trusted me and then trusted Jesus. And that can show you biblically. Paul would go like, yeah, follow me as I follow Christ. And eventually, I, I'll get out of the picture and you just, you, you just keep on going, right? Because I have a lot of people come in here. I don't trust church. I don't know, but I let that, that really handsome bald guy on stage, I trust, I trust him, right? And he makes sense. But, but that means that whoever follows me is a sacrificial lamb. And so I'm working with Sean Morgan and some different people like that to say, like, how do I, how do I prepare the soil? Mm -hmm. Before sabbatical, if you would have talked about succession, I would look at you and went, what? Like, like, I remember saying one time, if you say, but what if you get hit by a bus one more time? I'm going to throw myself in front of a <laughs> yeah. bus, right? Because it's like, do you, do you want me to die? Do you want me to leave? But now looking back, they were going, I think that they were, I don't know if it was, they were even thinking of it. 
you might burn out on us any moment here. Nobody said that to me, but do we have a, do we have a plan? That's what I think was in the back of people's minds. We're so dependent on you. Oh, yeah. It would all fall oh, apart. And they, it, totally, right? totally dependent upon me. Yeah. And that felt, felt good. Oh, it's too heavy for one person. It's too much. Crush me, right? Now, like I'm looking at, like my elders sat me down and went, what can we do to help you get ready for after that? Like, <sighs> what? No one did that for my dad, <laughs> you know? Like he, he died of cancer poor, you know, it's like, nobody's looking out for him. Nobody's thinking about, hey, Chuck, when you're not here anymore, what, how, how can we make sure that you and your, mom, you and your wife are, nobody thought about that. Th these guys are going, hey, how can we come alongside you? How can we do this? How can we do this? How can we prepare you for that? We want you to be healthy as, till the day you walk out of here. And how about this? After you leave here, will you, will you help the new guy? What? Right? I think Sean said it best is that the most important thing about my succession plan when it, whenever it happens is not who succeeds me, is did I prepare the soil, the flat and soil, for who God's going to plant here next? Because otherwise, you know, that doesn't feel threatening to me at all. The healthiest thing I can do is we had four different teachers come in over the six weeks I was gone. And they were quality, quality teachers, but people went, oh, there's voices other than Jim. That's not threatening to me. I'm trying to play a longer game now. Mm. Whereas five years ago, that would have been threatening. Nobody's speaking on my stage. And I want to read their sermon before they get up there. As a matter of fact, if you're going to have somebody come in and speak, make sure they're worse than me. <laughs> right? Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, you named something Nobody's that gonna I've say never that had anyone. <laughs> no one's going to say that out loud, but it's 100% true. Absolutely. It's like people feel threatened by greatness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Jesse, I got to ask you, when Jim came back from sabbatical, what was, what was the response? Like, were people thinking, this can't be true, or I'm just afraid he's going to be the same, or who is this guy? Like, what, and, and what, ne I'm sure there were apologies that needed to happen. <laughs> like, tell us, tell us about that process. Yeah, when uh, Jim got back, I mean, it was our highest attended service in years when Jim came back, because to the church, they were like, our pastor's back. We're so excited. For the staff, um, there was a lot of uncertainty. There was, we still hadn't fully yet leaned into, we are all guilty in making this the toxic workplace that it was. We, that still was something that was going to come probably another year later. And so there was fear. There was hope of like, man, I hope he's different. I hope that God takes this. And I remember we were recruiting a worship leader and he asked us and while Jim was on sabbatical and he goes, so is, is Flatirons in a dip or is Flatirons on the decline? And I just remember looking at him and going like, wow, Kevin, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know which one we are. And so much of it was dependent on how Jim came back and how the staff responded. And so um, there was still, I would say, probably half the staff had some animosity toward Jim at times. And so Jim came back and he met with every single staff in groups. Yeah. And I think, how many? 22 meetings? Yeah, I, I thought it was going to be the tour of shame mm -hmm. uh, to the 20 meetings over two weeks with every staff person from facilities to worship team to everybody uh, and then a couple specialty areas of, of people like I met with some women on staff who felt really really offended not just so much by what they had read from me but just the whole culture and so I met with them individually and the, the truth is every it was eggshells every day felt like I'm on trial and I'm sure they felt the same way because everything felt like well my, my counselor actually said I'm actually treating you for PTSD because everything was a trigger that felt like, oh no, it's, it's, it feels like that. It feels like that. It feels like that. See, nothing changed or you'll never change. And, and so I, I, I had to go like, okay, it's not that. It's not that. And they had to do the same. They had to do the same thing. The other thing is I think some people, because I, I know I did this. I think some people said, this is what I think I'm supposed to say because it would be Christian and expected. But their, their hearts hadn't changed or whatever. And so I, some of that I didn't find out for a year later. I think everybody said, we're going to give this a try. But for every leader that has to come back into this situation, if, if, if you think it's going to be unicorns and rainbows mm -hmm. and everybody's going to like, it's like, it's like going to camp and we're all going to sing a song and forgive each other and move on. 
and go like, let's just put it behind us. It's not reality. It's, it was a, it was a, I, I hear it. I came back in this January and COVID shuts the world down in March. So now, all right, just don't forget COVID happened. Okay. So now that just makes everything else just more and more and more chaotic. We're not having relational time because the offices are closed down and our services are closed mm-hmm. down. And now really the only people I'm seeing are production teams in offsite, like recording facilities with masks on their face. It's like, we're really not doing a lot of relational repair here, are we, right? We're just trying to get crap done because we got to put out something for the weekend online service. And so that, that delayed a bunch of stuff. And then, and then uh, so in July, in, in July, of, after I came back from sabbatical, we're four months into March, April, May, June, like we're four or five months into COVID. And now we face what every church faces, the paradigm is different and we don't know when it's ever going to be the same. All I know is I'm paying salaries for 175 people for five campuses that aren't meeting and we don't know when they are going to meet again. And so we threw out the option and I want to hear this because everybody talks about staff layoffs and that's a, that's a wrong, bad terminology. We, we looked at our staff and went, we don't know what the future looks like. We're not worried. God has it all. But we don't. But maybe this is a season where you go, hey, I think my, I think my, my season here is done. And if that's you, then self-select. We'll take really good care of you out the door, right? And so I'm, I'm on my summer break, and the lead team comes up and says, okay, here's, here's the list of people that, that are probably going to do this. There's a few that we probably need to kind of like, hey, no, your time is really done. There's a few on there, but we want to give everybody an opportunity. And they took me through the whole list of all those people. And um, my son was on it. My son worked in our spiritual formation department. And I'm sitting there going, oh. but it made sense. Relationally, it's just, mm. and emotionally, it was horrible. But I, 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 I trust you guys. It made sense, mm-hmm. right? So the week that it was supposed to happen, I, I'm on break, right? And a friend had invited me to go fishing with him in Alaska, and his dad owns a place there. And I said, okay, this sounds like it could be brutal. Do I, I can cancel that. And they're like, no, go, go, go. And I said, what do you think it's going to be? And we think, we, think, we think, you know, 12, 13, 15 people will probably self-select, and then we'll have, after the hard conversations, but we can do that when you get back. I'm like, okay, are you sure? Right. So I go to Alaska and I'm catching salmon and my wife's catching her first fish ever. And we're posting pictures like, Hey, and then I start getting these social media like comments going, it's pretty, pretty like uh, cold hearted that half your staff's gotten fired and you're up on a fishing trip. And I'm like, huh? What? And so I don't know what's going on. Right. So then I, 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 I break code and I, I email back and go, yeah, there's more. There's actually more than that. On Tuesday, after you get back, we're going to kind of have all the staff come together and kind of just like have closure around it. I'm like, okay. I, I'm at Mayo Clinic next week because part of my sabbatical comeback is an executive physical that took 10 months to get. I'll cancel it. Do I need to be there? Because I'll be there because this seems like a be No, 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 no. You just go to your physical. No, no, no problem. I come back from my physical from, from, from Scottsdale. I fly back in a, a day early, all right? And I'm driving to work, and I see two of my staff people walking down the sidewalk near my house. And I'm like, hey. And they turn their heads and walk away. And I'm like, this isn't good. And I walk, in, I walk into my office, and I see a couple of lead team people. I went, yeah, like, so what's going on? Well, 65 people resigned. I'm like, What? What? Yeah, I, 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 I thought you said 16. The 65 people resigned. And I'm like, oh, like all right, so how, what about Tuesday? Yeah, it was, it was really, really, really emotional. Did, did, you told them where I was. No. What? Yeah, they thought I was fishing while they were having a funeral for our staff. And I'm like... I didn't know. And one of my, one of my, my leaders looked at me and went, why didn't you know? And I was like, because you, you told me that you had it and that I, I needed it to go do these things. And he went, and 
the following week in staff meeting, we're in there, and I feel like I'm walking into an execution. Yeah. And my lead team stood up and went, time out. We did not set this guy up well. Mm -hmm. This is on us, not him. Here's what really happened. Here's the timeline. Here's what we should have done, and we dropped the ball. This is not his fault. And one of my, one of my younger staff, she raised her hand and went, well, thank you, because I thought, where the blank is my pastor? And I looked at her and went, yeah. I would think the same thing. I would think the same thing. If, if half my friends had, it felt like had lost their jobs or their careers or their ministries, and my leader was off playing golf or off on a fishing trip, I would have felt the same thing. That's not my heart. You've got to hear that. And they were like, we know it's not. We, we, we knew it wasn't your heart, but we just didn't know. And that's the moment. So that was in July before I think any healing actually ever, ever even began. Mm -hmm. right? And it was when mm -hmm. the, 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 my lead team said, we support this guy. We didn't do it well. And then slowly people begin to own, hey, around, we've got all got stuff to own in this. And we all, you know, we all have apologies to make. And we all, and it's like, I, I the, there's part of me, Carrie, it goes like, I, I wish I didn't need to hear apologies. I wish I didn't need to hear people own their stuff. But the human side of me is like, I do. I do. Uh, one of the, the big learnings is well, you can be wound, wounded secondhand. You can't heal secondhand, right? It's like is it you it, that, that has to happen one-on-one. -on -one. That's FaceTime. There is no shortcut. You can't do a blanket apology to everybody and everybody hear it. Individuals have been hurt, right? Like that, that I'm going to pick a team. That accounting team. Accounting team, right? Um, yeah. that just, that, that's the most general that that accounting team really like I really hurt them or or whatever it is it's not like I can apologize to the accounting team I have to apologize to Lene and to Molly and go hey I, I need to own this and I know that fell on you hard and and as a senior leader it, we I wish we didn't need well I need to own that back towards you too but but you kind of do because there's a human being's and in ministry, there's a relational. Well, that's reconciliation, yeah. is it not? Yeah, it is. And, and th that that Jesus was pretty smart. <laughs> it's like just go face to face yeah. with somebody and work out your stuff. Do it while you're still with him on the way. Otherwise, you're going to end up in jail, right? And it's like there there is no shortcut. There is no shortcut back to healing. It is long. It took a long way to get there. And a speech or a blanket statement is not going to do the trick. Now can we move on? The answer is no. We can't. Um, get thoughts around that. Even at, and even at, um, at, our, at, our, at our leader retreat this past week, this one, a new leader who wasn't here for sabbatical, he was like raising his hand like, I thought we were past that. See, he didn't go through all that with us. I thought we were past that. And those, and those, those, those people aren't here anymore. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. Just because we're past it doesn't mean there's not lingering, oh, no, it feels like that again. We all have that. Yeah, I, th I think it still comes up. And I think for anybody to think, we all thought, hey, Jim, he's gone for six months, he comes back, and it's going to be better. He's going to be better, we're going to be better. Our worst moment as a staff wasn't before sabbatical. It was six months after sabbatical where we were at our worst because I think – so many people were at fault for where we were, but nobody wanted to own it. And so subconsciously, we're just pointing fingers at everybody else. And I mean, Carrie, when 60 some people raise their hand and say, hey, I would rather be jobless than work at the church, like because of the environment that's been created. I think that was a moment where all of us, it wasn't just Jim, it wasn't just the leadership team, but it was everybody who realized like whether it was activity or the sin of passivity, or it was this judgmentalism that was like, I would never do this. I can't believe you would be like this or Jim would be like that. And people can feel that type of judgmentalism. It just fractured us. And so that six months after sabbatical was our lowest point. And then we realized we have to be so intentional about our culture, how we interact together from this forward. And it's been two years since that moment now. And, and it feels healthy. It feels healthier. Uh, we still have 
so much mm. work to do. Our staff would tell you that, but at the same time, we've had to put probably more work into our staff culture than we put into the weekends, oh, than yeah. we put into the campuses. We've had to focus on it. I remember coming back and finding out about the layoffs and I went, wait, they left? They left? Because here's my mentality. I, I, I had fought, I had done hard work for those six months. And I'm, I'm showing up every day. I am, I am doing my best. I am fighting. I am getting healthier. And I am, I am submitting myself. And it sounds like I'm patting myself on my back. But just, I'm just working hard. And then people that I had done 10, 12 years, 13 years of ministry with, carried their babies, walked through their affairs, right? Uh, walk through suicides in their family, walk through their addictions, walk through their betrayals, walk through, married them, you know, all that kind of stuff. There was not a thank you or a screw you. They just left. And I'm like, what? And it, it, I, I, again, I just, I, I just think I need to leave some, leave some leaders off the mat and go, dude, you're a human being. And relationship and betrayal hurts. Like, I don't think that, yep. I don't think that Jesus at the table, no one, Judas was about to, you know, totally deny him, was like chipper about it. I think it was like, buddy, go do what you have to do. You know, it's like, you're breaking my heart. You know, it's like, there's a human side of that, that, that we try to over spiritualize and try to say it shouldn't matter or move, move on it. It is a healing process and it's not quick. It still happens. I still get triggered. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is what I think is so rare about this story and so hopeful about the story. Normally, when stories like this get told, you're out of the picture, Jim. You've gone off to another church or into retirement or whatever, and you're telling your version of it, and somebody else is left with a mop and a bucket picking up the pieces. And what is, what is so rare is that you are back there facing your demons, facing the people who let you yes. down and facing the people you let down and saying, we're going to try to figure this out together in the name of the gospel. And I just think it's so rare. Where I'd like to, to maybe land the plane is there are leaders listening who are saying, oh man, we are where you were in 2018, 2019, and we don't have anything close to a resolution at this yeah. point. And, you know, the one thing that is encouraging, you said your governance wasn't perfect and you made a lot of mistakes yeah. and you're revising it now and you're changing your culture, but at least your yeah. governance intervened and got this moving in the end in a more positive direction. Um, you said you may not have listened if somebody came to try to do an intervention, but knowing what you know now, for leaders who are listening, who may say, hey, we're in a similar position. We have a toxic senior pastor, senior leader in the church, toxic board, whatever it happens to be, and they don't see it. What advice do you have to them? First of all, be very careful <laughs> and, 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 and choose your moment. And that moment will be uh, after a lot of thought prayer and even maybe some counseling about like, hey, this is what I'm feeling, right? How, how should I articulate this? Then I would, I would pick, so let's say a junior person on staff has some energy around decision or a, what, a posture or whatever it is, okay? One is, Pick your moment really, really, really carefully and don't use any accusative language because a person in my position who's feeling the pressure of carrying the ball or whatever is going to get defensive really, really fast. Everybody this side of Jesus is, if you put a finger in my chest, you're going to get a chest full back. You just are. Um, you call it insecurity or they <laughs> should be more mature than that, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Yeah, it's a human being who's feeling the pressure and one of the symptoms of his pressure fell on you. Okay. So your posture needs to be come in of help me understand. That's my, those are my favorite three words that put that in your marriage handbook in your parenting handbook in the dealing with your parents handbook in dealing with whatever it is. If you would lead with help me understand as opposed to why in the world did you do that? 
two different, very, very same. You brought the same answer, right? So, so help me understand. And here's, here's what I mean. My understanding was this is how this, we were, we had this agreement or this is what we agreed to do, or this is what happens when we're, and it didn't feel like that happened. Help me understand what changed or why you changed it. I'm sure yeah, I, I'll, I'll rip off Andy Stanley here is uh, one of the things he, he, one of the nuggets of gold of all the gold mine that's come out of it, that guy, right? Is he was talking about parenting is like when Andrew's a little kid or whatever that it was, Andrew would come and say like, Hey dad, can I go to the mall? Or, or no, Andy would say, Hey, mow the yard. And, and, and Andrew's response, his son's response would be, yes, sir, dad, can I ask a question? So the answer is ob- obedience. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on board, dad, right? I have a question. Help me understand, right? Yesterday you said I could go to the mall from three to six and I could mow the yard the next day. Did, did, did something change? I'm submitting to your leadership, whatever, but we had an agreement yesterday. It felt like it changed the day. Just help me understand because I'll mow the yard, right? And then Andy's response was, you're right. I, I forgot about that. Go to the mall. You can mow on Wednesday, right? And so when, a, when somebody comes in and says, does that make sense? It's like, that, that, you screwed up. You're a liar, Jim. You're a bad leader. That's what I'll hear if you put a finger in my chest at the wrong moment, right? If you come in and go like, hey, hey help, me, help, me under, help me understand something. Because here's the paradigm I was operating under. We said that um, unless it was like a, a, a just a, blah blah moment our service was in locked in on thursday and the last three saturdays you've changed the service I, i'm sure you have your reasons i don't i can you help me understand just so that i can right because maybe you don't know like like i don't i don't know what it takes i said this on the on the mxu podcast a while back dealing with church t- technology and and sound people right i don't know why i'm asking when i say can you change the song if you ask my mom, the church organist, to change the song, she just turned to another page in the hymnal. That's all it meant, okay? When I say change the song now, there's eight hours of tracking and triggering and computers, and then it has to be moved to this song, and then there's a video with lyrics that has to be re-edited. So the, the answer is yes, Jim. You don't know what you're asking because now nine people don't go home this weekend because you want to flip a song. Now, if you tell me that that's the don't don't change the song, right? But if you just if you just if you don't give me feedback, you don't have Saturdays anymore because you're reworking the songs. The senior leader doesn't know the cost many times. Guys, we have to admit that. We don't know the cost of what it takes to put on a weekend. Because we do ours. We we do our homework and we walk up and they shine thousands of dollars of lights and microphones and, and then they pipe it out through the internet and we have no idea what it costs when we go oh, hey just flip that you just took 24 hours of somebody's life away from it so so the one thing would be like the leader is like be a learner there's a lot you don't know because you're isolated at the top you just i just don't know okay for the person coming to, up, up to the tower to address the king you know what i mean by that is Take the posture of, of a learner and, and understand. Mm-hmm. Try, I'm trying to understand, and you're going to get a much better response. True. Than if you put a finger in that person's chest. So that be that that would be the one thing I think that. Um, well, I think that answers your question. Is like the, we've got to have a posture. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. he has a. I'm sure he has a list. <laughs> Here's how you deal with this guy. <laughs> I, I would say that if I look back on that season, what I wish I would have done differently, I would have said, number one, uh, I would have looked internally and, and thought, okay, how am I contributing to us being where we are in a negative light? So, so that I have a little bit of self-perspective. The second thing that I would do is I try to empathize with, this is the weight, this is the pressure, these might be the thoughts that Jim's having, rather than just assuming the worst about him. And then... um. I think honor is just really important. Walking, hey, I'm trying, I'm for you. I'm trying to support you. I'm not against you. And then I think what Jim said, help me understand, but not necessarily like, I remember a sad person asking me, help me understand. And it, it was phrased in a way that was, help me understand how you could be that stupid. <laughs> and for me, it it's like, help me understand 
in a curious way, you know, like assuming there's a reason, right? I'm assuming that, you know what you're doing. I'm assuming that you have a good reason for this. And so I'm trying to figure it out and I'm trying to realign to see things, how you're seeing it. And I think that when, when we do that, then leaders are so much more open to going, actually, I was just making it up as I went, or (laughs) actually I'm, I I made this decision because of this. Do you have any ideas? And so I think that that's, that's what I would do. And then at the end of the day, like if, if you can't, if you do that and nothing happens, do not stay too long. You know, like I've, I've seen so many leaders, they stay too long and then they get bitter. And when they get bitter, they actually get destructive. And like our culture wants to see the church fall. Our culture wants to see leaders in the church fall where Jesus wants to see the church thrive. Jesus wants to see leaders be redeemed in redemptive stories. And so if you can't participate in a redemptive story for your leader, um, I, don't give the culture what culture wants. Okay. Instead, yeah. like step aside and, and go somewhere where you can serve faithfully and serve and be excited about it. Wow. <laughs> that is really good advice because I think eventually you become part of that toxic culture. I agree. And if the leader is not open or you can't have that conversation, you know, that almost triggers the alternate scenario we talked about much earlier in the interview, Jim, where had there not been the intervention and you not been open, this could have gone could have gone in a very different direction. Jim, I want to give you the final word to the leader who's listening, senior pastor, senior leader, CEO business leader who's like, I am you where you were three years ago. And I, I saw myself in the mirror in these couple of hours. What is your word to that leader who is not healthy and maybe for the first time just realized, oh my gosh, that's me. Nobody understands what, there's nobody else in your organization that lays their head on the pillow. Other things that you have to think about. There's nobody else in the organization that responsibility there's it all lands on your desk and that is a very heavy place it's a heavy look and everything within us are what feels like we have to prove that we can do it by ourselves and god never ever supposed to do it it was not god telling us to do it and not God is always destructive and you know, because there's talent, enough charisma enough passion that you could run your church and not consult God for years and then a day will come when you can't and then you'll look around and just you'll panic and you'll just keep on going then your legs will buckle and then you'll lose everything and if I got a do-over, you know, the magic do-over, it, it would it would be like I would counsel. I, I isolated myself from other people in my situation because I told myself I don't need anybody. It was, it was fear. And it's don't, I don't want to tell anybody that I'm scared. I did a, I did a retreat at my, uh, for young pastors up at my cabin, and we, and we surveyed them. 14 out of 14 says, I'm as I go. The only thing I feel good about is my preaching. And so knowledge, and I see that what you're carrying is being to do. And if God is good, fingers, uh, and until you ask him for help, you were never you were we were never created to be rock stars. We were but they keep trying to make us rock stars. Right? We that liberty and they will continue to try to teach it treat us like it's too heavy and, and it'll crush you and i leaders go first i'm just telling you it'll crush you right and so so people out, out there and there are some bad leadership coaches um there are there are cohorts i'm in a cohort with i hate to use the word mega across the country and I, I we have nothing to prove because it's like we all got big churches how are you 
and it's like it's so refreshing to just go like I don't care how big you're, that that we went to that, that retreat you were talking about down in Mexico. All right, it's, that's just the answer. All right, because nobody cares. How are you looking at succession? How are you looking with conflict? How are you older guys dealing with millennials dealing with the old guys? You know, and it's like, and, and we're having those conversations. I think that I feels like a noble and right thing to do. It's very short lived. So it's not weak to say you need help, to say that you, you don't know what to do next. And if you'll relationships like I, I've got this here is like it doesn't mean you're a weak leader if you ask for help it means, and I had to learn that the hard way the wisest thing I ever did was surround myself with people who the part of love that I can come back to that I can't go I'm, he's not real and and I just, I can't be Rockstar Jim. I can just be who God's wired me to be. I'm all the crap. He loves it. <laughs> but we're, we're a good team. I like, I like leading in, in, I hate it. And it got shoved. Down. Like, oh, it's collaborative. It's collaborative. It's like, no, it's not. It better, but it's a learned, it's a learned thing. I'm learning it. And leading right now with Jesse, I, I say I'm going to succeed because I want to. Not, not, like I, I could do this for a long time, you know. And so it's, but there was a day, man, on a on a on a May nineteen, I thought it was over. I was really redemptive and redemptive, and the Holy Spirit was really redemption. It's a good story. It's still playing. And, um, it is possible. It is. I'm experiencing it. <laughs> uh, guys, listen, I really appreciate it. I think you really helped a lot of leaders. And uh, my prayer is that you also hope the church, help the church get healthier. That's why we're doing this conversation. I can't thank you both enough for your transparency and your honesty. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed yet, do so. Share it with a friend and leave us a comment. And I've got two things I want you to do before you sign off today. Number one, if you're a church leader, would love for you to go out and visit hegetsuspartners.com slash Kerry. Click on the link because here's what's happening. There's a $100 million campaign going on, basically sharing the gospel with the world. And if you become a partner for the He Gets Us campaign, here's what happens. People who are interested and respond to the ad get connected to your church. It's an opportunity for you to enter into dialogue, have a conversation with them, people who are really authentically exploring Christianity. So go to hegetsuspartners.com slash carry. And also, if you haven't yet checked out the Art of Leadership Academy, make sure you do so. The Art of Leadership Academy has over 150 high quality, done for you resources for you and your team. Whether you're leading a church or whether you're leading a small business, you're an entrepreneur, it's done for you. I will train you in communication. I'll train you in team leadership. I'll train you in so many different things. We have PDFs, videos, downloads, cheat sheets, you name it, we've got it. It's ready to go. But it's beyond that. The Academy is also a community. I do live monthly coaching calls. We have an incredible community involved in daily dialogue. It is troll free and um, it's available for a very low membership fee every single year. Would love for you to check it out. Make sure you check out theartofleadershipacademy.com. Click the link and we'll see you inside there because here's why I started it. I graduated law school. Nobody taught me how to run a law firm. I graduated seminary and nobody showed me how to run a church. Had to figure it all out. So that's why we created the Art of Leadership Academy. It'll help you lead and help you thrive as you do it. Thanks so much for watching the podcast. We'll catch you next time. And I hope our time together today has helped you thrive in life and leadership.